Good afternoon, my name is Sarah Riff. I'm the Outreach Coordinator and Undergrad Advisor for the Latin American Caribbean and Iberian Studies Program. And um, you probably already noticed it, but I'll just mention in the back corner we have Fair Trade Coffee from Just Coffee, and we have an assortment of teas and hot water um, and some snacks, which you're all welcome to have. Also in the corner we have a clipboard if you're interested in joining our listserv if you're not already on that. We send out a weekly event newsletter with all the events that we have coming up in the next month. And a bunch of handouts about some other events that we have that you might be interested in in the coming week. So, I am going to just give a quick introduction to our speakers today, and then Randy Dunham's going to come up and give you a sort of a little overview of what this uh, course it is was, um, and then we'll let, the, let our presenters take it from there. So um, today we are going to be, um, for the women here, are going to speak on uh, reflections on Cuba. Uh, so Masi's, along with the business school, provided some. Um, funding to some of the students who we've asked to come and give a talk here today to help with some of the expenses related to them. And um, so we have Kimberly McCormick, who is an econ and international studies major. <laughs> Julia Rupp is a Lassie and Spanish major. <laughs> Catherine Volkers is an international studies major. And Jennifer Wagman is a Spanish major. And then we have Professor Dunham, who is a, um, with the International Business Program, as well as uh, Management and Human Resources. So thanks, everyone, for coming today. My part will be very brief, although they don't believe I can be brief. <laughs> uh, we, we just returned two, day, two days ago. Two days, mm -hmm. two days ago. Uh, from the field study portion of our Cuba seminar. So I, I was blessed with 20 amazing students from all over the campus. We've been meeting three hours every week, and we've been learning about culture, history, economics, business, politics, everything we could get our hands on, particularly Cuba-U.S. relations during the semester. In fact, today at 4 o'clock is our last seminar for the semester. Um, and we had the opportunity to spend 10 days in Cuba as the field study component of our seminar. Uh, I think you will hear from our team that it was a very interesting time to be in Cuba. Uh, these days are very interesting times to be in Cuba and being there while the President and members of Congress and members of Senate uh, and others were in town and while things were changing was particularly exciting. Um, our motto for the team, for the class, was, this is the plan. This, this may change. <laughs> <laughs> unprepared, right? That was unprepared. That was our motto. The students went in with that mindset, and they lived that mindset. Um, this would have been my worst nightmare as a student trip, had they not been that way. Uh, instead, it was my best trip ever. And I'm going to let you guys tell about it. I'll be here if they want me to say anything else. All right, well, as you can see, our mission was an examination of topics like history, culture, society, politics, just as everything Randy just said. Um, let's see. If when we what The main thing that we learned in this trip was the attention that will be paid to evolving relations between Cuba and the U.S. Apparently I did one little light on technology training. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Funny. Funny, Randy. Okay. Um, so I'm a Lassie's major, and I kind of just wanted to start out the presentation by relating how um, the Cuba trip really related to my Lassie's major. So one thing that really the Cuba seminar did for me was I've taken um, some coursework very related to Cuba, the courses such as Latin American politics, um, the history of U.S. and Latin American relations from the colonial era to the present. And actually last semester I was able to take a course um, on Caribbean history, um, actually with Professor Scarano. And it was a really great course, and the, this Cuba course really helped me specialize in 
one particular country in the Caribbean. And um, what was great about the Cuba course is, as you have all heard, we did such a wide variety of topics. And as a Lassie's major, that was amazing to be able to see more so the business side of things, which I haven't really studied. And Professor Dunham's class really um, benefited me in that way. And so this is beneficial to any future career I may pursue because Lassie's provides a very nice platform for that. And this class has really helped give me a wide range of topics of what I should be thinking about in any future um, career I may pursue. So the business and culture that we studied in the Cuba seminar was very beneficial for everyone. And it was a great course. I'm going to go over here. If you can't hear me, let me know and I'll go closer to the microphone. But there was a lot that we packed into our 10 days when we were in Cuba. Um, starting with the people, we had all sorts of very interesting speakers in addition to people we could talk to on the street, especially us because we all have Spanish language skills, which was a significant bonus. Um, some of the really, really interesting speakers that were some of our personal favorites was the vice president of the sugar industry, Asuka. As 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 Azucar? AZ Cuba. So yeah, it looked like Azucar, yeah. but it was AZ Cuba. Yeah, and he was just a fascinating speaker and was one of the brightest people I've ever met. Um, I had the privilege of sitting at lunch with him. I think you didn't take him. And just listening to his story is truly incredible. He took a ship for 21 days from Cuba to Europe so that he could go study chemical engineering. In the Ukraine. Yeah, in Ukraine. So when it was, it was still in the USSR. Yeah, it was just some of the stories he was telling were very, very interesting. Um, additionally, we heard from one of the top ranking, I think it was also the VP of the Baseball Federation, who, <laughs> and he was just a fantastic guy. He had a lot of stories from his 16-year career um, within Cuban Baseball Federation, just playing as a shortstop, and he had an amazing batting average for a shortstop, if you ask me. He was career average was like 278. Um, which was cool. And then the tobacco industry, we actually got to go tour a tobacco hand rolling factory, um, which was something I never would have even thought about. And learned all these great things about the tobacco industry, but also the healthcare industry, to like follow up on that. Um, so that was interesting to kind of juxtapose our questions about healthcare and tobacco because these are two of the bigger things that he was known for as well as the various artisans and musicians that we just encountered, whether it was through scheduled site visits or just while we were out exploring Indiana. Um, then, I don't know. Sure, I'll go next. It says cuisine, but I'm gonna go ahead and put cuisine and lodging together. As Randy said in the beginning, our model going in is this is the plan, this may change. Our trip was planned well in advance of President Obama's announcement. So Randy spent a lot of time with his team getting all of our lodging set up, all of our plans, well, and then two weeks before, everything changes. <laughs> so um, we had initially planned to stay in a hotel in Havana for the duration of our trip. And we found out a couple weeks ahead of time that that was no longer going to be a possibility. So we weren't sure what was going to happen. There were a few alternatives. One, the first of which was cancel the trip and not go. Nobody was on board with that. Um, but they wanted to, to change our reservations from out of Havana into a city that was three hours away, that was very much a, a tourist destination, all inclusive, and we knew that if that would happen, we would miss out on a lot of the things that were going on in Havana in such a historic time with Obama's visit. So casas particulares are what I would kind of call or associate with a bed and breakfast. Um, people have apartments and they have homes where they open up a room, where they open up several rooms within that home and rent it to tourists, people visiting. So again, Randy has an incredible team. None of us still can figure out how he worked it all out. <laughs> but we were s spread like within the zone of where the security was cutting people off for Obama's visit. Right across the street, some of us from Hotel Nacional, which is one of the stables of um, the hotel industries in Cuba, or in Havana specifically. So those experiences were different for each one of us. You know, imagine going into a home where chances are no English is spoken. So we all have Spanish speaking skills, but a lot of the people on the trip did not. You know, that experience in and of itself, air conditioning, hot water was iffy. You know, breakfast was sometimes you got it, you weren't quite sure if you were going to get it or what you were going to get if you did. Um, so that experience in and of itself, I think that all of us found really valuable. It was a glimpse into Cuban culture and Cuban society that you don't get staying at a five star hotel. 
So I think that was a, a huge deal for all of us, and it gave us the opportunity to see a lot of these people coming in and out of Hotel Nacional and neighboring communities, you know, stopping, getting stopped by the motorcade several times while we were traveling. Um, I think all of us were very appreciative to have the opportunity to stay in Havana during our trip. Discretionary learning time is what we told the U.S. government we were going to do um, as an excuse to be tourists in the city because we had to tell them that we were learning, but we were learning, just not in a classroom setting. Um, Havana Viejas, the old Havana, a lot of great experiences down there to really see how the Cuban society is changing as they're allowing more private-owned businesses, restaurants. There was a great shop where a woman learned how to screen print t-shirts. So a lot of these people up and coming, learning how to be entrepreneurs, learning how to build businesses for themselves, was a great um, glimpse into that culture as it's evolving. So exceptional experiences, again, Randy's <laughs> connections never cease to amaze us. <laughs> we found out the day of the baseball game that the connections that he had been working with in the U.S. Embassy had come through and we had all got tickets. They may not have had our names on them, <laughs> but we had tickets. We may have had to lie to the Secret Service, <laughs> but we got in. <laughs> so I think everybody was just in awe of such a historical event with Obama there or Secretary of State Kerry, um, President Raul Castro was there. I mean, you just had a wide variety, and not to mention the press and everybody else, and the Cuban citizens that were there to see them and their reaction to su such a historic game as well, even though they lost. I and mean, everybody was just yeah. happy to be there and happy to see how things were changing. So I'll give everybody else an opportunity to talk about different experiences that they thought were exceptional. Uh, one of my favorite things was the Malacan, and that, okay, before we left for this trip, Randy tried to describe the Malacan to us, and the, the biggest premise of it is it's just like this half wall, kind of, that uh, runs across the coastline, this rocky coastline of uh, Havana, and it's right next to a highway, and it's just a sidewalk and a little bit of a wall. And so when I was like listening to this description in class, I was like, okay, why do people go hang out here? Like, it's right next to a highway, there's no beach, like people just hang out on a wall. It just did not make sense to me. But then as soon as we got there, I was out there every single night. It was gorgeous. And when you're out there at like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, even 11 o'clock, um, any night of the week, everybody's just out there having a big party in the streets. There's people playing music, people talking, people dancing, people laughing. Uh, it was definitely one of my favorite experiences just to be hanging out there with my friends and just talking to some of the local Cuban people, just kind of feeling out what Havana nightlife culture is. Um, we toured rum, sugar, and the cigar factory, which are the main exports in Cuba. Um, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, we got to see Cubans rolling the cigars, and then we had the opportunity to actually buy those actual cigars that Cubans had just rolled. Um, so I got a few of those. <laughs> um, we went, we had a rum uh, tour, sugar, the sugar tour was, I thought was really fun, because we started out in the fields, the sugar cane fields, and we were given the opportunity to hold these giant machetes and <laughs> cut down uh, a cane of sugar, and then... Um, once you strip it of the outer layer, you can bite into it, and then you can like suck the sugar out. So that was really fun. Um, and then do you want to touch on discretionary sure. learning Sure. So during our discretionary learning time, we had one day where we were in Varadero, which is a very high tourist town. And we stayed, um, we spent the day at an all-inclusive resort. In the morning, we had lectures and briefings on the travel and tourism industry and in the afternoon we had discretionary learning time on the beach so that was really fun to be able to hang out with everybody swim in the ocean a few of us went kayaking so that was really fun um, Havana Vieja was amazing during discretionary learning time just walking up and down one of the main streets called Obispo that was amazing just seeing all the shops and the restaurants and I spent um, one of my discretionary learning times with Randy, so it was really cool hearing all of his experiences and recommendations. And at one point when we were in Habana Vieja, there were some booksellers, and mm -hmm. we, some of us were able to purchase some really cool books. So I was able to purchase a book about Jose Marti and his writing. So that was amazing to be able to buy a Cuban author's book in Cuba, which not many people can say that. And a lot of the restaurants that a lot of us tried in our discretionary learning time was also 
amazing. Um, we got to try a lot of different new foods, meet some new people. Personally, one night I went to a restaurant by myself for dinner, and I was able um, to talk with the staff, and I learned a lot about them and their life in Cuba. And it was really amazing to hear their perspective on things. And um, one of the waitresses is, uh, was a 20-year-old student who is studying psychology, so it was really cool to hear about her schooling experiences. And another is a mom, so it was really cool to hear about her experiences as a mom in Cuba. So the discretionary learning time was definitely very vital. Um, to this whole field study experience because it allowed us to see Cuba in the raw and do our own, um, have our own experiences with Cuba. Another thing about the discretionary learning time with uh, Old Havana was we had the opportunity to experience Old Havana when it was mostly just Cuban people when Obama was there because, like we had said, we had this, this option of being shipped out three hours away. Oh. Oh. Most of the other... Uh, tourists in town had to be shipped out, so it was kind of just us and then all these very high-ranking officials, Cuban people, and so it was kind of night and day to see the difference when Obama was there versus when he wasn't, when Old Havana just kind of came alive for the tourists, and what it was like, yeah, 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 it was, for me it was really, really interesting, and yeah. we, you know, like, we were walking around like the day before Obama came and you'd see people painting doorways, and being able to kind of compare what Havana is when Obama's there and what it is when he's not was definitely a really cool experience that nobody could have planned on. Challenges. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one of the main challenges, or one of the main um, things that we had to assimilate to was the water, and you couldn't drink it, especially just brushing your teeth. You had to pour a bottled water on it. And I lived on the edge. I brushed my teeth with tap water the whole time. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> um. oh, but she was six foot two before she did. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So some people would get um, a little bit sick, which wasn't that fun. Um, <laughs> there were there were foods that um, mostly when we had our three course meals, which is obviously what the government wanted. They wanted to look in the eyes of the U.S., really, they wanted to look good. So we would have meals that were, had lobster, had um, uh, a lot of desserts after, um, and one of my favorite foods and experiences I had was a little shop and I went to and I got a personal pizza for 50 cents. It was so good. <laughs> so that was one of my favorites. Um, understanding business and Cuban mentality. Uh, does anyone want to talk about the, yeah. the um, when we met with the students? Oh, yeah. So we had the fortune of meeting with some graduate students studying business at the University of Havana. And um, it was really cool because we got to ask them questions and they asked us questions. But one of the big, um, I guess, misunderstandings was I was trying to figure out what they actually studied because in their country, technically capitalism is not allowed. And so for me, it was just kind of mind-boggling. Like, we were talking to all these experts who had this vast understanding of economics and international marketing and just how to conduct business on a global stage. So I, was, I asked them, uh, what, like, what do they study when they study business? Like, how, how do you study business? Mm -hmm. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And I was just like, OK, like, what, what did I say wrong? Like, I thought my family was half decent. Um, and they, they, didn't, they study international business, and there's no separate two tracks. Like, here at our business school, you can study just domestic business. You can specialize in finance or marketing or operations. And then you can also partner that with international business. But because there's not really an outlet for business directly, just domestically for them, they have to study international business. So that was just something funny for us to wrap our heads around and just kind of realize, like, hey, you know what? Like, Cuban business is no different from ours. It's just they're looking a big picture while we sometimes just focus in on ourselves. Mm -hmm. So another challenge was working together with classmates to learn as much as possible. Um, this, in a way, was a challenge because for me personally, um, as a Spanish and Lassi student, a lot of the business things that we were going over in lectures with our speakers were a bit over my head. So it was very beneficial when my classmates um, who were in the business school asked a lot of questions because it helped break down what was going on and it helps me understand things better. And also, I feel that 
we were able to do a lot of symbiotic learning because we were such a diverse group. There were some business students, there were some non-business students, so I feel like we were all able to symbiotically learn and um, kind of just understand each other's concerns and questions and feels a bit more by, by being able to listen to each other. One of my um, biggest challenges actually was being constantly with a group of 20 students. So you have absolutely no alone time because um, even if you go back to the hotel, you're with your roommate. So um, I had to take one night, a personal night, where I watched Slumdog Millionaire inside the hotel. <laughs> so that was, so that, was, that was hard, being constantly surrounded by big personalities. Um, a lot of, we, we learned so much, but it was exhausting. So. I think for me, just one last thing with this slide to put some of these things into context. We had a lot of personal challenges, a lot of challenges within our group, but also Cuba itself has a lot of challenges. And that's something that we were able to see in person. I mean, it's easy to read about things. It's easy to read about how people struggle with certain things when they don't have access to materials. Um, but to actually see it in person was incredible. So the far left-hand side, that's an example of one media tent. And that's how many generators they have to bring with them. Cuba does not have the access to power the way that we do. And there's a lot of power outages randomly throughout the city because there's overloads. So I imagine that the, the media teams coming into Cuba for all of the coverage with the president, with the game, everything else, had significant challenges. So that was just one example of what they were dealing with. The middle picture and the bottom, that's an example of, um, I don't want to say a hospital, but it, like a miniature, like a doctor's office. Like you would, you know, hey, I'm sick, my kid's sick, I'm going to take him to the doctor. That's what it looks like. That's what they're working with. And it, one thing that I tried so hard to wrap my head around is how the Cuban people do so much with so little uh, in terms of resources, in terms of access to materials. They don't have it, and we do, and they do so much. Um, the far right-hand side, you're talking one of the biggest sugarcane um, factories in the area, and that's what their head office looks like. They have, like, blue curtains kind of up everywhere. The air conditioning kind of works. You know, if you look at their switchboard and their phone on that desk, that is the technology they're working with. One of the top industries in sugarcane in the entire country of Cuba, and that's the technology they have. But they still function, and they function well. So I just kind of wanted to put some of those into context, because for me, that was something very, very eye-opening in what they can work with. The top right is an example of strange foods. <laughs> <laughs> the shrimp had eyes. It was fine. <laughs> I will say some other challenges, we kind of went through some of these, no access to internet, as you know, taking a group of college students who are constantly on their phones with no access to internet anywhere. If you did have access, it was limited and you had to pay five kooks for it for an hour. So not everybody did that. But I will say that because of that, imagine sitting down at a meal with 20 college students who can't be on their phone. Conversation was fantastic because people were engaged. That was probably one of the best parts. It's the first time in a long time that I've been able to sit down with people and not have someone on their phone or take a phone call. It was really great to be able to connect with everyone that way. So it challenges with that, however, as we were there during the Brussels you know, terrorist attack, which was difficult. Some of the students with us knew people who were flying into Brussels and to be unsure of what was happening with your loved ones and what was happening in the world. We were there while Obama was there, but I can guarantee you, you guys had better media coverage. We had no idea what was going on. So that was also another challenge in terms of contacting people and knowing what was going on where. Um, so another challenge, one thing that I personally came across and other Spanish speakers came across was the Cuban accent. Um, it's very different than what we may hear on campus because a lot of the faculty are from Latin America or Spain or Puerto Rico, so it's a very different accent compared to Cuba. Um, it's, their accent is, it depends on the person, but it, it was faster, or they don't pronounce the S's at the end of the words, and that took some adjusting, but it was very interesting to learn from their accent and, and hear it. And another challenge was um, connection, connecting with respect to be able to speak the language, whereas, whereas other classmates could not. So <clears throat> those of us who were, who are Spanish speakers were assisting our classmates. Um, actually, one of our classmates was trying to learn Spanish, so she would ask us words and would really be independent with trying to ask questions. And um, that was really cool to see that because those of us here presenting our language skills are 
proficient, at least proficient enough where we can communicate by ourselves. So it was fun to be able to help our classmates learn new words and assist them if they were at a restaurant and wanted to know a certain word or how to ask or address the waiter or waitress. So that was really interesting, but it was also fun as well. And then also for me, I've done, and I know Kim's done a lot of area studies. Um, so I focused on Russia and the Soviet Union a while last year. And I learned a lot about just how their architecture is structured. And then when we were in the Casa Particulares, I noticed a lot of the similar style architecture. And you saw a lot of Soviet style appliances still in place at these houses, which I thought was really, really interesting. I was very fortunate to be able to compare and contrast and see that direct influence from that time when Cuba was supported directly by the Soviet Union. But you can also feel that Spanish influence, and that was really interesting as well because they are originally colonized by Spain. Um, so there's just this interesting juxtaposition between the Soviet influence plus this very deeply rooted historic Spanish influence. And then, I don't know about you guys, but for me, um, I definitely was struggling trying to figure out what the development status of Cuba is. because. It's, some people will tell you it's developing. Some people will tell you it's underdeveloped. Uh, there's just a whole range of what you see. And when we first started the trip, actually, our tour guide said that we've been learning a lot of fiction in our books because we've just kind of been reading and we don't really know what Cuba is. And when we get here, we're going to see the reality. But the truth is somewhere in between. And we kind of kept that with us the whole time because, honestly, you can be there for another one of our speakers said you could be there for a week and write a book. You'd be there for what, like six, six months. months? And, and write a sentence, yeah. and then there for a year and not know what to write, yeah, something like that. Yeah. I think that was also very prophetic of what kind of the Cuban experience is, because you can be there, and you can be watching, and you can be learning, but at the end of the day, you still don't know what you're seeing. You don't know what you're learning. I have a question. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so you mentioned the internet, and how some of you were willing to pay the fire Mm -hmm. and so we what about the Cubans? Uh, you know, what's the internet access been there for, like in the class of the Cuban parking lot, and that kind of thing, like what did you notice or see? So Cubans do have to pay to have access to the internet. That was actually one thing I was asking the waitresses that one night I was at the restaurant. So they do have to pay, so they would have to go to um, what might be called an internet cafe. Um, but in the casas, there were some people who had internet. Right? There was one group um, that was blessed with Wi-Fi. Keep that in mind. <laughs> one out of twelve with Wi-Fi in their casa particulare, and um, I personally didn't have any Wi-Fi, which wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't I a big problem. Ah. Uh, gotcha. For the most part, Cuban access is, is well, technology is kind of the biggest lacking thing that they really have. Um, people have cell phones, which is kind of surprising, but they don't use them for texting as much. It's more um, to download illegal media from the U.S. There's this thing called the packet, which is how they get a lot of outside information. And like one guy in a restaurant showed me like a video clip of something from his cell phone, and I think that's kind of the most, uh, I guess, common use of outside access. So the cell phones cannot intercept, inter access the internet. Cuban cell phone cannot, yeah. so they connect them somehow and download stuff yeah. to it. Not using the internet, but using it. I actually it. had the opportunity walking through Havana Vieja to see that happening, kind of in a back corner. And it's amazing, they kind of get like a small group and it's laptop, laptop, cell phone, and a whole bunch of USB ports just kind of <laughs> everywhere. Um, connecting everybody's information and downloading it and things like that. So to have that be your only access to the rest of the world has to be an, an experience for sure. And I mean, we use texting in the U.S. as a way to communicate socially. In Cuba, they use it as a way, um, well, first of all, they don't have texting, obviously. They use it um, just for what we just said, media coverage. And um, they, they communicate, um, they go to the Malacan, they, they go, there's pay phones everywhere. There's pay phones. They communicate in a much different way. And it's much more social, and I respect that. So, for conclusions, um, so there are so we still have very many questions unanswered. Um, yet, oh, <laughs> there are very many questions answered, but still some questions left unanswered. 
including things such as if the embargo is lifted, um, the Cubans are hopeful, and does anyone have it? Yeah, I would just say a lot of the conclusion is, was, um, and, and we'll let, the, let our presenters take it from there. So um, today we are going to be, um, or the women here are going to speak on uh, reflections on Cuba. Uh, so Lassie's, along with the business school, provided some um, funding to some of the students who we've asked to come and give a talk here today to help with some of the expenses related to them. will be very brief, although they don't believe I can be brief. <laughs> um, we, we just returned two, day, two days ago, two days, <laughs> two days ago uh, from the field study portion of our Cuba seminar. So I, I was blessed with 20 amazing students from all over campus. We've been meeting three hours every week, and we've been learning about culture, history, economics, business, politics, everything we could get our hands on particularly Cuba-U.S. relations during the semester. In fact, today at 4 o'clock is our last seminar for the semester. Um, and we had the opportunity to spend 10 days in Cuba as the field study component of our seminar. As you can see, our mission was an examination of topics like history, culture, society, politics, just as everything Randy just said. Um, let's see if when we what the main thing that we learned in this trip was the attention that will be paid to evolving relations between Cuba and the U.S. Um, so I'm a Lassie's major and I kind of just wanted to start out the presentation by relating how uh, I think you will hear from our team that it was a very interesting time to be in Cuba. Uh, these days are very interesting times to be in Cuba and being there while the president and members of Congress and members of Senate uh, and others were in town and while things were changing was particularly exciting. Um, our motto for the team, for the class, was, this is the plan. This Spain may change. <laughs> <laughs> unprepared, right? That was unprepared. That was our motto. The students went in with that mindset, and they lived that mindset. Um, this would have been my worst nightmare as a student trip, had they not been that way. Uh, instead, it was my best trip ever. And I'm going to let you guys tell about it. I'll be here if they want me to say anything else. 